So beginning in 1 John chapter 4, starting from the verses that we covered last time we were together, basically John is saying no one has seen God at any time. What we know of God is seen in the life of Jesus Christ. How does God speak? How does he interact? What did he look like? What did he sound like? All of these are seen in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And then as he ascended, Jesus, and he went back to his father, he left with us a gift a helper, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that indwells the believer. That's you and I, the Christian. He fills us up. When we spend time in his word, when we look into his heart, we get to see what it is that God has for us. And the Holy Spirit enables us, empowers us to walk out the very truths that we read. Perhaps that truth that's in my mind needs to make its way to my heart, and I live it out of my heart. So it's from the inside out. And why is that important? Because the Christian is how the world sees God. The only way for the world to see God is by the way the Christians love one another, by the way we live our lives. John says, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected or aimed at us like a telescope. I like that analogy because when I consider God's love, I was once far off and I once lived a life of confusion. It was blurry and like a telescope, that love of God aimed at me. I had nothing to do with it. God said, I choose you and I'm going to make you who are far come near and you who are blurry clear. And God initiated salvation in our hearts. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, his Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Verse 16. And we have known and believed. We have known and, and believed. We have known and shown. When I know him, I show him. And this is not a matter of trying. This becomes a matter of dying. When you are called to Christ, the call is to die. You no longer live here. Christ reigns. Christ rules. Christ lives within us. Now, I'm going to tell you this. God loves you. His word says that. It's a promise. Unconditional love. Now, you might not feel that. To feel it's great, but to know God loves you when you don't feel it, look at me. That's called faith. To know God loves you, even though you don't feel it, that's called faith. Faith. Now, faith, through the lens of God's word, sees more, hears more, and knows more. Through the lens of the word of God, I get to see more. I have greater hope in my present circumstances because the word of God allows me to see over them. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, defines faith like this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, a lot of people reduce that verse and explain our faith as being blind. But that's not what that verse means. Now, faith is the substance, is the word assurance. And anytime that word assurance was used, it was always connected to a title deed, to stand under a promise. In other words, faith is the title deed of things hoped for. And the evidence, or the word is, ready? Conviction. Conviction you feel, conviction you know. How does faith grow? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you put all that together, you walk by faith, not by sight. That's the verse that people say, yes, our faith is blind. And again, I say, no, our faith is not blind. I walk by the lens of God's word. And I don't let my sight let me down because my sight can fail. Faith isn't the opposite of reason. Faith is not the opposite of logic. Faith is factual. Now, I'm going to take the widely and wrongly believed definition of faith, which is about being blind, or they'll explain it. Faith requires you to take a leap in the dark. And I'm going to take that and say, if that's true, if that's the type of faith that we're supposed to have, just blind faith, just step into the dark, then it takes more faith to be an atheist. 
than an actual believer. Because the Bible and the lens by which I see life testifies to the things that can be proven. Both science and creation. All of it is factual. And when I read God's word and that becomes the lens by which I live, I'm not leaping in the dark, I'm leaping in the light. And guess what? I know exactly where I'm gonna land. Interestingly, the African Impala can jump 10 feet high and up to 30 feet long. But if you go to the local zoo, you'll see those same African Impala in a cage with perhaps no higher than three to five feet walls. They could jump so high and so far, how come they're not leaping out of there? Because the African Impala will not jump if it can't see where it's gonna land. And I know exactly, according to this word, where I'm gonna land. So I leap in the light, and faith will not only bring our souls to heaven, but faith brings heaven to our souls. This is why John said love has been perfected among us in this, verse 17, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. He jumps to a day on God's timetable that is just as set as the birth of Jesus, as the death of Jesus, and every other prophetic happening that was ever predicted in the word of God. Judgment day is just as set in God's timetable as any other day. And John is saying, if the love of God has been aimed at you, perfected in you, it comes with a consummation of confidence that you can have boldness on the day of judgment. I want to understand if we get the weight of the day of judgment, that what is future-oriented in the here and now, I can have a confidence. John chooses the same word perfected, which means teleo, but it has a different compound to it. It's not just the idea of maturing, like we talked about two weeks ago. It's actually compounded with the same word. He writes, teleo, teleo. He's saying completely complete. The love of God will be completely complete in you, perfectly perfected in you when you're able to be in the presence of God who is no longer your judge. He is now your father because of his son, Jesus. Do you have that confidence in your present? How do you have that confidence? Tetelestai is how you have that confidence. Tetelestai were the three words that Jesus proclaimed from the cross after he had accomplished what it is he came to fulfill, he yelled in victory, Tetelestai, which is, it is finished, which is related to this word perfected, which is Jesus leaving a receipt on the debt that he paid. That's the word. It actually means that, that when Jesus said it is finished, he said, oh, you need a receipt for the debt that you owed and I paid? Here it is. This is the reason you can have confidence on the day of judgment, a day that's coming. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27, actually puts it like this. So while the culture and this very um, subtle philosophy that is a lie is permeating into our youth's minds through music and media, and they're believing that this life is all they have, so why not go live it up YOLO? For those of you above a certain age, that means you only live once. And according to the Bible, my lens, I say, no, no. You don't only live once. The Bible declares it is appointed for men to die once and then after the judgment. But this is the hope for the believer, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly await for him will appear a second time. This is Jesus apart from sin for salvation. In other words, he came first as the lamb who would lay down his life for our sin, but he's coming back again as the lion. And the reason we can have boldness in the day of judgment is because our judgment was poured out on Jesus. It's the word propitiation. John has used this word. He was saying at the cross, God's perfect justice and God's perfect mercy were completely intertwined. Like God had a justice because he had to deal with sin, but he didn't just deal with our sin and leave us just not guilty. He gave us above and beyond 
he gave us forgiveness, and then he goes, wait, I'm gonna wrap you in my righteousness. This is unbelievable. But the Bible talks about it, so we're supposed to believe it, that we can have confidence. Jesus said before he went to the cross, John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32, the language is specific. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Right now, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And then in verse 32, he says, and I, if I may be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. And then in case we are left wondering, what was he talking about? If I be lifted up? Verse 33, the writer, he says, and this, Jesus said, signifying by what death he would die. See, our eternity rises or falls based on what we do with the cross. See, when Jesus went to that cross, he turned it into a throne where he would execute his judgment. And I chose those two words intentionally, execute and judgment, because the judge decided to be executed in order to execute his judgment. Doesn't make any sense. This just judge decided to become the justifier. In his own death, he paid the very debt that you and I could never pay except by our lives. It was the cross. All of history points to the cross. Both prior to and even now, we look back and God said, I'm gonna leave an illustration for the world. It says that Jesus hung next to two thieves. That makes three crosses on Calvary's hill. For some reason, we see a perfect picture of humanity in the two thieves. The dialogue is pretty interesting. The one thief mocking with the crowd turning to Jesus, saying to him, if you are the Christ, save us and save yourself. Are you seeing what he said? He's not asking for mercy. In his plea to save us and save yourself, he's asking for vindication. The other one says, are you crazy? We are here. You don't fear God. We're under the same condemnation. He says, we belong to be here. Where we're at, we deserve it. This, this is what he says. This is the due reward for our actions. Then he turns to this one who he heard the whole entire crowd was hurling their insults at. He heard the words from Jesus right back that, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Something within this thief's soul leapt. And he turned and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. And if you're not getting what I'm putting out, on one side was humanity that rejected Jesus. On the other side was humanity that accepted Jesus. And that is the gospel where we have a decision to make, where the one who rejected died in his sin and went to a real place. The one who recognized Jesus died to his sin because he recognized the one who died for his sin. That's us. In case you don't understand the context, that criminal, he was adjudged guilty, unfit to live with men and society. And God said, oh, him? I choose him because I'm gonna live with him for eternity. That's the hope. That means we are all invited into the family of God through Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter two, verses 13 to 15 goes even into more detail about what the cross accomplished. It says, you dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that were against us, your charges. You were guilty as charged, which were contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. And I love this part. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. This is what the cross did. This is the reason we can have confidence on judgment day. Instead of going in with our knees knocking, cowering, which should be our posture, we can come in to a good, good father as sons and daughters. Love has been perfected in us that we can have boldness in the day of judgment. Ready? Because as he is, verse 17, so are we in the world. Wait a second. We are here and he is there. 
And God is like, yeah, as my son Jesus is, so are you in the world. Not just about a future date where you were stand before God, but even now, your position in Christ is one of righteousness, if you have chosen Jesus Christ and given him your life. Your position in Christ is in righteousness. And guess what else is in righteousness? Your condition. Now, you might not feel it, working it out. That's the word sanctification. God is in the process of making us look more like Jesus, a little bit at a time, day by day. It's progress, yes, even through stumbling and falling, but moving forward. God is making your condition one of right standing. But I ask the question because the verse says, I am in this world as he already is. So I say, how is Jesus right now? Like right now, in this very moment, on this Thursday in January in 2020, how is Jesus right now? So I put scriptures together and I realized Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now. Position of authority. And when I put all of the scriptures together, I realized out of Jesus' own mouth, Jesus is reigning right now with full authority. All authority, he said, has been given to me. And then he deployed the church to advance the gospel. And he said, all authority, I have it. I am Lord over the smallest atom. I am Lord over the largest planet. I hold the universe in my hand. I am before all things and in me, all things are held together. Your emotional man or woman is held in the hands of the Father. If you stop fighting it and you allow the peace of God to do its perfect work, stop being anxious and frustrated and confused and surrender and let go and let the Lord who is full of authority have his way in your heart. He's Lord over government. Not a single king, empire, or ruler has ever risen or fallen without God's sovereign will. So we look out in our country and we panic and politics births confusion and arguments. And here we are posturing, going back and forth, and we forget that if our God's not panicking, then nor should his church and people. We rest in the full authority of Jesus Christ. He's Lord over sickness. He's Lord over illness. He's, look at me, he's Lord over cancer. If you have the time, I implore you to watch Dr. Tony Evans speak on behalf of his late wife who just went home to be with the Lord right after Christmas. She was going through the battle with cancer. I watched the eulogy given by Dr. Tony Evans' son, Jonathan, and in the midst of talking about his wrestling with the Lord, after his mother had passed away, he went to the Lord and he said, how could this happen? We were not only praying here as a church, this country was praying on behalf of our mother. In fact, the world was praying for healing for Lois Evans because of his prominence in Christianity. And he said, God, it would have been to your glory had you healed her. What does the nature of your victory mean? Isn't it in your name that we claim healing? And it was amazing because Jonathan, he came to this conclusion, he said, and the Lord impressed upon my heart, son, just because I didn't answer your prayer your way doesn't mean I'm not gonna answer the prayer anyway. He said, your prayer only ever had two answers attached to it. I was either going to heal her or heal her. I was either going to let her live or let her live. I was either going to be, put her with family or put her with family. And in this, he was saying, it didn't matter. The victory was already won in Jesus. And the victory, even though our minds can't comprehend it when we lose a loved one, is already in heaven. <laughs> two answers to prayer when you understand God's sovereignty. Yes, and yes. Why does knowing God is reigning with full authority matter? Because it gives me peace. It gives me absolute peace. What is Jesus doing now? He is providing free accessibility, reigning with full authority and providing free accessibility. Interestingly, because of Jesus' position at the right hand of the Father as the high priest, he has interceded 
on our behalf, which means I can approach the throne room of grace boldly and find mercy and grace in the times of need. So I have free access to the Father. I wonder if any of us are taking advantage of free access to the Father. Why is that important? Because I can go to him for pardon. When I've messed up, I come back to him for fresh pardon. I come to him with my prayer and he hears me. And of course, I go to him with my praise because there's no longer a divided wall or dividing wall between me and a holy God. He's reigning with full authority. He is providing free accessibility. And right now, he is administering from a fixed autonomy. Ephesians chapter one will help me explain what that means, fixed autonomy. It says, and he, God the Father, put all things under the Son's feet and gave him, the Son, to be head over all things to the church. You might feel out of place in this world, trying to get ahead, trying to find your position in the world and always comes up short. And God is like, stop trying to find your place in the world. You'll have a place and a purpose in my body. And the reason why Jesus is the head is because he is the one that we operate out of. He's the one that moves his members. He is in charge of Coastal Christian, not any elder, not any leader. Jesus Christ is the head of his church. And the reason I know how to do church is because his mind is right here and he gives us access to it. And it's in his word that I find my place in his body and then I'm used for his glory. So don't ever say you don't know your purpose. Everybody that's part of the body has a place and a purpose and Jesus is giving us opportunity to serve him for his glory. So our standing in the world is not based on the world. Our standing in the world is based on Jesus sitting at the right hand of his father. Colossians, interestingly, Paul would pen, if you were raised with Christ, then seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life was hidden with Christ in God. Verse four, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We maintain our confidence right here, right now, because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, So we set our mind on things above. The reason why I find myself anxious is because I'm often consumed and focused on things on earth. Isaiah 26, three, he will keep him in perfect peace, shalom, shalom, when his mind stays on him. When my mind stays, look at me, when my mind stays on him, his peace stays on me. So we choose faith over fear. I choose faith in Christ over fear. Verse 18 says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Fear involves anguish. Fear involves insecurity. Fear involves dread. Fear involves punishment. The fear here is not the Old Testament form of fear, which says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is a strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. That fear means reverence and awe and respect to a holy God. This fear, this is debilitating fear. This is the emotion of fear. And there is no fear in God's love. In other words, when he cast out the devil on the cross and dealt with sin, according to Jesus' own words, fear went with it. And when fear went with it, I can come before a holy God, not in fear, but by faith, because the cross cast out any fear. Now, human terms, we know it's true. You can't love someone and fear them at the same time. Not the unhealthy fear. You can't say you love someone and then actually fear approaching them at the same time. You see, love will inspire closeness and intimacy. Fear creates distance. There are people who might control others by using fear tactics, and in the name of, oh, I love her, or I love him, or I love them, in the process of causing fear. Oh, that's not love at all. You see, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, I guess... I'll read it to you just so you see how fear shows up here. It's when Adam and Eve, they, of course, disobeyed God. 
They have taken of the fruit and they are exposed now. They realize they're naked. They actually covered themselves. They sewed fig leaves together. Any attempt at covering ourselves in our own sin, self-justification, religion, self-righteousness, we cover ourselves. And it tells us in verse eight, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse nine, then the Lord called to Adam and said, where are you? I could do a whole sermon on just that question. Where are you? God's asking a question, not because he needs the answer. He wants you to answer the question. I know where you're at. Do you know where you're at? Where are you? Watch what happens. Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Are you understanding the relationship prior? They experienced fellowship with God. They went for walks in the garden, but the moment they made a decision to disobey him and they realized they were naked, that shame they attempted to cover, they heard his voice and that voice was one of compassion, yet they translated it as one of condemnation and the fear set in and they hid themselves from God. Now we know in verse 21, God initiates redemption. Verse 21 says that God put together for them tunics of skin and clothed them. God covered them. It perhaps lines up with all of scripture to say that that was the first sacrifice. All through scripture, it is impossible to have any remission of sin without the shedding of blood was shed. And God was covering his children. And in this, I see his love for me. I have confidence but I have to have knowledge of his love. If you feel condemned, it is not God. Fear will rise up and get you to shut down. You won't pray to God, or if you do pray, it will be through the lens of fear. This is a sad but true story. A mother was walking along a bike path that paralleled a river bank, and she was with her little toddler girl, and the toddler girl got too close to the river bank and tripped and fell into the water. The mother panicked. She couldn't swim. So her first instinct was not to jump in. She began yelling. A determinate amount of time went by before the first strangers heard the mother's agonizing cry for help. They looked and saw the young girl floating. They jumped in to the water to find out tragically that not only was the child already dead, but the river was only waist deep. See, the mother could have saved her own child, but didn't because of fear from the lack of knowledge. And how many of us are not engaging salvation because of fear and a lack of knowledge about our God's love? Let me say, if you are intimidated by God, it's because you are not intimate with God. Now, there are two schools here. To be intimidated by God should fall on those that don't know God. There should be a real fear and a real terror to anybody that doesn't know God, but the devil, the God of this age, has blinded eyes and minds. There's an infinite gap between sinful humanity and a holy God. And that sinful gap, that infinite gap, can only be brought together by one word, repentance. There's nothing sinful humanity can do. Cannot present a gift, an offering, a sacrifice. Can't present good behavior. Can't present a resume. Can't present a lineage. Can't present a bank account. Can't present real estate. Nothing can fill that infinite gap except repentance. This is what falls on the non-believer. You must repent of your sins. But God's not using hell and the punishment that awaits those who reject Christ as a tactic to lord it over people. That's not God the Father, that's the Godfather. See, the Godfather, he uses fear to control. The God the, God the Father we serve, he's not using fear and he's not using hell as a threat. People have taken Matthew 10, 28 and they've twisted Jesus' words to say, 
that God is using hell as a threat. This is what Jesus said in response, contextually. Context is so important, church. The disciples came back after they experienced persecution from the rulers. And of course, that was intimidating. There was fear there. They were scared of people that could kill them. And Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus is saying, choose which fear is going to dominate you. Are you scared of a man? He can only touch your body, and the worst he could do is push you into the presence of God? Or you fear the one, healthy fear, a God who can kill the soul and the body. This was a motivating fear to them. He was not using hell as a threat, as many believe, that we have an angry God who is using heaven and hell, and he's kind of putting it out there and saying, if you don't choose me, you're going to hell. No, 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 sin comes with a threat. Sin threatens hell. The wages of sin is death. Sin comes with the threat, and the son comes with a truce. A truce is a peaceable agreement. We were at war against God. We rebelled, and Jesus says, I'm going to go to war with sin and death and reconcile them back to myself. And it's in that decision that we no longer have the fear of judgment, that we no longer are gripped by sin. The second thing that could cause fear, now you know God, you've repented of your sins, you are a bona fide believer, you are a Christian, you represent Jesus, yet for some reason, you're still fearful to approach God. You're still intimidated, you still, you come to the pastor and say, I don't feel like I'm forgiven. There's this shame in my life. That's not an infinite gap, that's a definite gap. The definite gap is something you can identify and remove. It's perhaps a sinful way of life that is gnawing at you and it is in, keeping you in bondage. And of course, when we're in sin, we should feel some type of way, but that should not hold us back from going to get more mercy and grace. See, it's the mercy and grace of God that changes us from the inside out, not behavior modification, or perhaps it's a misconception or a false perception of who God is, as I said earlier. And what re was required of you is to have a refocus of your faith. That's the only way to remove the hindrance that is keeping you from approaching a good God. How do you refocus your faith? Verse 19. We love him because he loved us first. How do you refocus your faith? You focus on the fact that God loves you first. God loved you not when you got your life all put together. That's another reason people won't come to God. They say, I got to get me together before I can step through the doors of that church or come to God. And God is saying, no, I want all of you. I want the mess of you. I purchased every part of you. I love you in your worst. I proved it when I gave you my best. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us. I, I cannot stress enough. I love that language. God has his own type of love, separate from our love. And he demonstrated it by giving us Jesus while we were yet sinners. In other words, God did not give us his son when we were lovers. God gave us his son when we were sinners. Are you understanding there's nothing between you and the father because of the son? This makes everyone eligible. Anyone from anywhere who's done anything, can come receive this free gift of grace in Christ Jesus. Now, no doubt people will reject that. People have rejected that. They'll use a million excuses for the, why they can't come to God. That's sad. That should break our hearts. Yet something just as sad are those who say they do love God, verbal, but whose lives don't demonstrate the gospel. That's what John says next. He says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Notice this person who does not love his brother, who he sees, how can he love God who he does not see? John's saying, profession is not possession. It's easy to say, I love God. Can't really prove that verbally. But John is saying, oh, it's provable by the way you love others, by the way you demonstrate that love that was given to you in spite of you, the way you share it with those around you. 
Three times John has already written in chapter 2, verse 4, the moral test. He writes in chapter 2, verse 22, the doctrinal test. And right here in chapter 4, he writes the relational test, all of which call out those who are faking the faith. Chapter 2, verse 4, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Chapter 2, verse 22, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, a.k.a. Jesus is God. Right here in verse 20, who's lying? The person that says, I love God, but doesn't love their own brother or sister. Translation, generally speaking, your neighbor. Everybody is your neighbor. Your worst enemy is your neighbor. Your abuser is your neighbor. Specifically, it's the church body. Interestingly, if ugliness or coldness or unforgiveness or prejudice or hate exists in my heart, then I have an imaginary picture of who God is. And that's the reason why I could say I love God and then go over here and not forgive my brother. That's basic Christianity. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Now, yes, it might be harder to forgive some people because of the things they did, but the judgment is not on you, it's on God. You forgive and let God deal with that. Forgiveness cuts the cords of bitterness and resentfulness that are attached to a heart that says, I'm not gonna let go. And John's like, you can't say you know God and love God if you can't even extend mercy and forgiveness to others. Because what you did against God is greater infinitely than anything that will ever happen to you by man. So invisible love for God, according to this verse, will show itself in observable love for others. Like you'll see it. Jesus says, if there's a time and you're worshiping God, you're at the altar, you got your hands raised, you are the loudest one in your row, and God drops in your spirit, puts on your heart that somebody else has something against you. Not even you have something to go ask them for forgiveness. They have something against you. You got to go seek forgiveness. He goes, put down your worship. Put down the gift. Go make right. Go reconcile. Yeah, but I tried that. My, my brother or my sister, they rejected it. You did your part and your conscience is clear. You gave that which God gave you, which is mercy. This is the basis of the Good Samaritan parable. Of course, this man was bleeding out, left for dead on his way. And of course, two people that claim to know God verbally, you better believe it, a priest and a Levite, they saw the man in need and they went on the other side and they went on their way. And the bad guy, according to the culture, a Samaritan, he sees the man in need, he stops on his journey and he meets the man's need. In other words, he extended mercy. That's the one that understood loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. See, I'm not, I'm not just talking about doing good to my brother because I say, I love you, God. How does that translate? It's not just about doing good and serving others. It's not just about humanitarian efforts or this word, which is great, philanthropy. It has the word phileo in it, which is brotherly love. But it's, this, isn't the, this isn't the love God has called us to philanthropic efforts in the world to meet causes and meet needs for the sake of the need? That's great. But this love is about mercy. This is about giving away a forgiveness that you were given. Not just verbal, do I say I love God. I step out and I demonstrate the gospel. That's tough stuff. And John goes, yeah, it is, verse 21. But this is a commandment we have from him. Like this came down the pipeline from God that if you love God, you will love your brother also. Now, one thing about God's commandments is that they come with God's enablements. God will never command you to do something that he's not gonna empower you to actually do. He's gonna empower you to go and extend that mercy. He's gonna empower you to show that love to the person that might not deserve that love but to know this and not show this 
is to make the gospel of no effect. So we, we end where we began. We choose faith over fear. Faith in Christ, that though I might not feel his love, faith tells me he loves me. I walk out in faith. I look through the word of God as my lens. I know exactly where I'm going to land. I live now in confidence. And when I get to the throne room and I am in the day of judgment, I can have boldness because my judgment was poured out on Jesus. He left the receipt in case you need to check the date. It was the Calvary cross that paid for you and I. And we can come to him any day, any time, because he already gave us his best, even when we were at our absolute worst. This is, church, the charge. This is, church, the gospel. I believe this is what Matt Glancy was trying to convey last Thursday. The gospel is this. So this is what we do. Let me pray for you. Father, we do look to you for empowerment according to your word. Your Holy Spirit will give us the ability to live out our Christian walk and testimony to a world that's watching. But ultimately, Lord, we know you are sovereign, sitting upon a throne in full authority. And because you already accomplished your work through your son, Jesus, we can come to you anytime, at any point, and ask you for more grace and more mercy, and you give it. Who are we? The psalmist would write that you are ever mindful of us. Thank you for what you have called each of us to do here. I pray that we experience new love. I pray that we worship out and that you would set a fire down in our soul that we can't